Coding the Universe with cosmologist Andrew Ponson, author of The Universe in a Box. Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week we're exploring the fascinating world of computer models of the universe. Now from, from humble beginnings to mind-boggling simulations, this is the history of how we unravel the mysteries of the cosmos using the power of computers. Astronomers and cosmologists seek to understand what happened billions of years ago as well as what may happen billions of years in the future. They explore the mysteries of dark matter, black holes, galaxies, and so much more. Among their tools are computer models and simulations, using mathematical equations and data to represent physical phenomena. Researchers develop and test their theories about the cosmos. Now, in the 60s, 70s, early 80s, computers were becoming more sophisticated and powerful, and so did our cosmological models. But still, this was the age of, the, of Atari 2600s, the TRS-80, and my first computer, the Timex Sinclair 1000. That 16K memory expansion module made that machine quite the powerhouse. Uh, supercomputers at the time were capable of performing just a few tens or maybe a hundred million calculations per second. Yet researchers used these systems to simulate gravitational interactions between galaxies, letting them collide, merge, and form new structures. In the late 1990s and the 2000s, uh, computer models reached new levels of realism and complexity. They could start to account for the effects of dark matter and the newly proposed dark energy, which make up most of the mass and energy of the universe. Modern cosmological simulations are among the most ambitious scientific projects ever undertaken. Now, uh, the first computer model simulating the structure of a large part of the observable universe ran in 2012. Ten years later, the Thesson simulation revealed how radiation helped shape the universe in its first billion years. Cutting-edge supercomputers allow us to model the entire history of the universe from the Big Bang to the present day. We're now witnessing the birth of mind-bogglingly complex simulations, showing us the birth of stars, the formation of black holes, as well as the ebb and flow of cosmic filaments tying galaxies together. Next up, we talk with cosmologist Andrew Ponson, author of The Universe in a Box. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Andrew Ponson. He is a professor of cosmology at University College London. He's been seen on NOVA, How the Universe Works, and now the highlight of his career on The Cosmic Companion. <laughs> he's in his new book. The Universe in a Box Simulations and the Quest to Understand the Cosmos just came out, and it's worth a check out. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so first of all, for those who may have heard the word but don't really know, can you just give us a brief introduction to cosmology and what does it help help us learn? Right, yeah. I mean, the idea of cosmology is to ask that fundamental question, which is where do we come from? 
Uh, I mean, ultimately, it's it's about what gave rise to structure in the universe. And by structure, I mean everything from, you know, stars, uh, uh, galaxies, which are kind of collections of, of hundreds of billions of stars, um, but, but also planets like our own, the one that we live on, and all of the atoms and molecules that you and I are made out of. So, so fundamentally, cosmologists are trying to answer that question, what, what has given rise to all of this structure in the universe? Hmm. And um, can you give us a look? And of course, your book um, talks about coding the cosmos, mm -hmm. developing simulations, and give us a look into the basics of those simulations and how, what are those? What are those doing? Right. Yeah. So the the thing about the the, the cosmos is it, it's it's vast, right? I mean, I've already mentioned the hundreds hundreds of billions of stars, even in in our galaxy, but our own galaxy is just the start. There's hundreds of billions of other galaxies out there. Um, and, and even that's kind of the tip of the iceberg in some sense, because the more we've looked at the universe with telescopes and so on, the more we've come to understand that there's a lot that we don't see, as well as the stuff that we do see, there's a lot that we don't see. And that includes really mysterious substances like dark matter, dark energy, things like that, that maybe we can get into and as, as well as that black holes. So there's, there's all of these things out there in the universe. They're all contributing to a kind of giant tapestry, if you like, of the way the universe has formed, the way all of this stuff has been brought together. And it, it all kind of contributes to this overall story that I'm talking about. Now, that makes cosmology really exciting, but it also means that to understand what's going on, we need a bit of help. And that's where simulations come in. So the idea of simulations is that we get some of the world's best computers to do a lot of the hard work for us. If you, if you want to track what's happening to all of these materials across cosmic time, then it really helps to have a computer to do a lot of the, the hard calculations that go alongside that. And I guess in the end, um, what they're what they're really doing is trying to piece that together and see how all of these different elements interact and come together to produce this very rich, evolving universe that that we all live in. And and so this, the the book is trying to tell the story of how, how did that come about, and and that turns out to need a, a lot of human effort to get simulations like that to work. So it's about telling that story. Mm. And where does can give us where does this begin? What are some of what were some of the earliest forays into simulating the universe? Oh well, I mean, you can you can trace simulations back a very long way. I mean, you you can certainly trace them back to uh, somebody like uh, Ada, Ada Lovelace in the nineteenth century. Um, you know, computers didn't even exist then, but um, she was working with uh, Charles Babbage who was trying to build a computer out of a kind of steam powered components. So these kind of giant metal rods and cogs and things the, the idea was to try and build something very much like what we think of as a computer today. But of course, the, the technology wasn't really up to it. Um, but 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 Ada Lovelace wrote uh, all the way back in the 19th century about this possibility of trying to recreate the natural world using lots and lots of computations using using these computers and um so then if you kind of fast forward into the 20th century then well i i guess a great example would be the weather forecast so the, the, the weather forecast where in you know we rely on it to know what's going to happen tomorrow that's actually a kind of simulation that it's taking lots of data about what the atmosphere um, around the world is like today, and where are the storms, and where are the clouds, and how's the wind blowing, what's the temperature, and then it's using some laws of physics to try and predict, well, if it looks like that today, what is, what is it going to look like tomorrow? So the idea for doing that, using the laws of physics, you can trace all the way back to the start of the 20th century, again, long before computers were actually available, and there was a really weird character called uh, Lewis Fry Richardson, who in, in, in the middle of, of World War, I mean, he, he was actually serving in the trenches uh, of World War I uh, when he started trying to compute um, uh, by hand 
using the kind of equations from physics, try and compute a, a weather forecast by hand. I mean, it, it was absolute madness. It, it, was, it was never going to work, right, right. but it was just too much work for one person to take on. But it, all of this laid the foundation so that when computers really did come along, and that was towards the end of the Second World War and, and, and after that, then a lot of the foundations were, were there and waiting and then people could kind of jump on them and, and start actually doing simulations i remember in your book um if i remember this correctly that um the first weather forecast only had about a 30 percent accuracy rate even for the next day oh that's right yeah so so you know if you go back to the 19th century um then some of the first weather forecasts they were kind of based on rules of thumb so the, 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 what would happen is that they would use the, the telegraph system to send weather data um, a, a, across to a sort of central location. Um, this happened, for instance, at, at the uh, Smithsonian, and uh, they, they, they would gather all of this information together and then try to make a prediction about what would happen next, based essentially on prevailing winds and just the way that storms were known to track and so on. Uh, this was an incredibly hard thing to do. And so when it became possible to use computers to instead base this on the laws of physics rather than a bunch of kind of best guesses, then the weather forecast accuracy really started ramping up until today. You know, I mean, we complain about it, but actually, you know, the weather forecast is remarkably accurate. Uh, it can be accurate for at least a week ahead. And, uh, and that's really that's really quite something, you know, that's actually a kind of like a triumph of science hiding in plain sight and so, and so we can take a lot of those same ideas and apply them to cosmology hmm. and what what discoveries have so far been made using simulations about the cosmos that really excite you what makes you go wow that was that was wonderful study here wonderful sim yeah i, I mean it, it's hard to pick one i mean or even two i, I think you know, one of the things I would really point to is something I mentioned earlier on dark matter and dark energy. So the, these are these mysterious extra substances that we think we need to make sense of, of the cosmos. So originally, dark matter was an idea that came up in the early 20th century. It wasn't really given a lot of credence. But it was just based on um, looking at galaxies and uh, looking at clusters of galaxies and seeing how things move in our universe. And in particular, if you look at, at some galaxies and see how the stars move within that galaxy, they're basically moving too fast. So if 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 you imagine a car is taking a corner too fast and there's not enough friction from its tires to actually keep it on the road, it's just going to slide off the road. And it's it's not going to end well. <laughs> and when, when we when we look at the stars on on the outskirts of galaxies, there's a similar problem. You see, we can we can measure how fast they're going, and it's way too fast for the forces that we can that, that we know are there. That the forces of gravity that we calculate should be there are um, are just not nearly enough. So that that gave rise to this idea of dark matter. The kind of idea that there's some, maybe there's some extra stuff, and we call it dark matter because, well, we just we can't see it, so it's 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 not a great name for it to be honest. Maybe invisible matter or something like that. Um, but you know, you can see that it's a kind of well, it sounds a bit like a made up idea. It's a kind of trying to paper over the cracks and stuff that we don't understand. But what simulations were able to do is take that idea and really run with it and say, okay, if the universe is full of this dark matter. And by the way, we think there's like kind of five times more of it than the ordinary matter. So there's a lot of it there. And the simulations were able to take that idea, run with it and say, what would, what would the consequences be? Mm -hmm. One of the things that they came to predict was the existence of what we call now the cosmic web. So this is a, a, an expression of, of, of how galaxies themselves. So this is now on enormous scales in our universe, but Galaxies aren't just scattered at random through our universe. These giant galaxies themselves line up into an even more gigantic structure, which, which we call the, the cosmic web. And the, the, the remarkable thing is simulations actually predicted the way that that cosmic web would form and the particular properties it would have. 
And then over time, we've been able to actually measure that and, and, and see that it's correct. So, so that to me is one example of the way that simulations kind of that, that, that raw power to compute things has actually contributed to making a case for some real thing out there in the universe. And this magnificent tool, what, what are some of the greatest mysteries or maybe your favorite mystery that you are investigating right now? Well, I mean, there are so many mysteries. There's more that we don't understand than, than we do understand, if, if I'm honest. I mean, let, me take a, let me take a couple. I mean, one is uh, the origin of supermassive black holes. So when we look at the centers of galaxies, we see that they have lurking there giant black holes that we call supermassive. These things are um, black in the sense that they are the, the, the force of gravity is so strong that anything that falls into them, including light, is just never going to escape ever again. So that's what a black hole is. Um, and to, to make something like that, you can imagine you need something pretty dramatic to happen. So you can make uh, a black hole, for example, at the end of the life of a star, it can, can kind of collapse in on itself and, and it creates such strong gravity that that actually makes a black hole. But when we look at the centers of galaxies, we see evidence there from the way things are moving around that there are black holes there that are millions of times more massive than a star, or perhaps in some cases, even billions of times more massive than an individual star. So there's a kind of profound mystery, and we have some ideas, but there's a profound mystery about how do you make black holes that are that big? And, and that is one thing that a lot of simulators are really grappling with at the moment. And I guess coupled to that, we're also looking with a lot of interest at the results coming from the James Webb Space Telescope. So this is a, a huge project that NASA uh, launched uh, when was it? It was kind of a year and a half ago now. Um, and it's been taking pictures of the very early universe, take, taking advantage of the fact that light takes time to travel across our universe. So if you can look at the right kind of light, you can actually take pictures of what galaxies used to look like just because the light's been traveling for, for all of that time. Um, and in doing that, James, the, the James Webb Space Telescope is throwing up some surprises. It's, it, it's throwing up some challenges to how we thought the galaxies really did form. Um, so that is another thing that people are looking at really closely and trying to work out, can we make sense of this? Or is it something fundamentally new about our universe that we didn't know before? And speaking of new, and seems the last six months or so, all the news has been a been talking about is artificial intelligence, especially generative artificial intelligence. I'd love to get your views on on how this new technology could be applied to sims as well as the exploration of the universe. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think. One of the interesting things I found when writing this book is it slowly dawned on me that artificial intelligence is itself like a kind of simulation. I mean, it's 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 slightly different from the simulations we've been talking about so far in that they mainly start from laws of physics that we kind of understand reasonably well, whereas artificial intelligence is more starting from some ideas we have about how human cognition actually works and so it's, it's that that of course is a, a a very different field but at the same time you can think of artificial intelligence as a kind of and it's trying to simulate something like human thought and as you say you know over the last six months this this has really uh, uh hit the mainstream but actually astronomers have been using forms of artificial intelligence for some time now you know at least 20 years or so i i, I would say so we, we've had a bit of a head start. I think that the pace of change is taking even astronomers by surprise. But the kinds of things you can do, well, there's, there's all manner of things. You can use it to help you analyze images from telescopes, for example. I mean, the, the, just the quantity of information that's coming from some of our telescopes now, especially if you look at things like the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is just about to come online, it's going to be scanning the sky taking pictures every single night for 10 years. And this is going to add up to a huge amount of data, way too much for any human astronomers to really get their heads around. So 
Um, one thing that artificial intelligence is definitely involved in is, is processing these images and flagging what, what's of interest here, what deserves further investigation uh, for, for any number of reasons. Maybe because it's a comet or an asteroid and we need to follow it up to find out is, is, is this safe? Uh, or, or maybe because it's a supernova explosion that's telling us something about the distant universe. It, using artificial intelligence to flag these things up and and help humans decide, well, where, what should we spend our time looking at? Um, that's just essential at this point. But I, I, I think, you know, we're going to see it go beyond that. And, and, and for me, the real excitement of artificial intelligence is to try and, and see how can it relate data, which is very good at handling data right now, but how can it relate that data to scientific theories? But at the moment, artificial intelligence is not quite so good at doing that. It, it, it will, in, you know, if you've played with chat GPT, it will, it will answer you some questions. You can use it to crunch data, but those two worlds don't meet so much. And trying to get artificial intelligence to look at new data and actually kind of describe what's going on or even make hypotheses about the, what's this saying scientifically. Um, that is something that that isn't isn't possible right now, but I think it's going to become possible. There are, there are various avenues where we are looking into to how to do that, and so I, I think there will be a future where science and astronomy, more specifically, is done kind of hand in hand, but between machines and humans. And obviously, that comes with a with a, a whole ton of questions attached to it as well, uh, societal questions and so on. But I, I think, you know, th there's just no escaping the, the fact that artificial intelligence is with us and we have to figure out how do we use it in a responsible, constructive way. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that is possible. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Andrew. It was fabulous talking with you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. And that was Andrew Ponson, Professor of Cosmology at University College London. Check out his new book, The Universe in a Box, from Riverhead Books. Uh, researchers are now simulating the evolution of entire universes. Yeah, you heard me right. Universes. Today, computer models are essential for understanding the universe. They help us explore its history, structure, and dynamics. They also assist in discovering new phenomena and testing new hypotheses. Thanks to Generative Artificial Intelligence, or Gen AI for short, astronomy is now entering a new era of discovery and innovation. Now, astronomy is driven by two things, light and data. Usually, swarms of telescopes and instruments collect huge amounts of information from the sky every day. But sometimes that data is incomplete, noisy, or corrupted for one reason or another. Generative AI models can help reconstruct and fill in blank parts of those measurements, producing images free of obstructions or noise. Generative AI can also help astronomers find things in the sky that they may have otherwise missed or overlooked. For example, uh, the technology can help identify faint galaxies hidden in the background of photographs, or when gravity warps light from distant targets, distorting their shape. Recently, an examination of radio waves from 820 stars revealed eight sites where signals showed possible signs of an intelligent origin. These may turn out to be human-made transmissions, but this shows how Gen AI might help us find life on other worlds. This technology could also discover new types of objects or, or phenomena that are theorized but have not yet been observed in the real world. Astronomers might also use these tools to simulate what they expect to see from different scenarios, as well as what a black hole might look like from different angles or distances. 
Gen AI is not only a powerful tool for astronomy, but also a creative one. It can inspire our astronomers to ask new questions, test new ideas, and imagine new possibilities. It can also help communicate astronomy to the public in a far more engaging and accessible way. For example, Gen AI can create new artworks or animations based on astronomical data, such as this reimagining of an image of the Whirlpool Galaxy we recently released. Computer models are not perfect and they have their limitations and uncertainties, but they are constantly improving and evolving just like the universe itself. Generative AI and computer modeling is changing astronomy as we know it. These technologies are opening new windows to the cosmos, making astronomy more fun and exciting than ever before. And the future of astronomy is inviting us all to join the adventure of exploring the unknown. Are you ready? Oh, I'm super ready. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we look at living with a body in space. We're going to be joined by Christina Sauer, Associate Editor for National Geographic Kids, talking about their new work, Why the Human Body. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, head on over to thecosmiccompanion.com or .net and sign up for our newsletter sending every episode of this show to your email inbox. Tell a friend about the show. Share, follow, comment all over your corner of the universe. Don't let me stop you. Clear skies.